The storming of the Taco Forts took place during the Second Opium War between Britain and France on one side and China on the other in 1860. The battle led to the British and their French allies occupying Beijing and forcing the Chinese to sign a peace treaty, which still impacts China's view on the West to this day. Hi, I'm Chris Green, the History Chap, telling stories that bring British history to life. And as I was researching this particular story, I just realised how many fascinating sub-stories there are. And after a poll with my subscribers, I've decided to break it into two parts. So in this part one episode, I want to share with you why the war ever happened, an audacious plot to poison all the British in Hong Kong, and a humiliating British military defeat, which also happened to take place at the Taku Forts. The First Opium War between Great Britain and China had ended with the Treaty of Nanking in 1842. The Chinese, as proud and arrogant as the 19th century British, resented a treaty being forced upon them under duress, and over the following years only gave it half-hearted compliance. No one more so than the governor of the port of Canton, Ye Ming Cheng. Ye was arrogant and xenophobic rather like many of his British adversaries, so it wasn't going to end well, was it? As I often discuss with my supporters in my members channel, wars usually start with a whole lot of small incidents that are compounded until they reach a breaking point. And that point on this occasion was in October 1856, when the Chinese seized a Chinese-owned vessel which happened to be registered in British Hong Kong. Whilst Ye argued that the ship was essentially Chinese, as were the 12-man crew, the local British consul, Harry Parks, argued that that was irrelevant, as it was registered in Hong Kong, so technically it was a British ship. As such, it was protected by an agreement that the two governments had signed in 1844, which said that the Chinese authorities could not arrest the crews of British registered ships who were conducting legitimate trade. Harry Parks had been born in Blockswich, Staffordshire in 1828. By the time he was five, he was an orphan and spent the rest of the 1830s living with an uncle before being sent out to China to live with his cousin and her missionary husband when he was just 13. By the time he was 21, he was fluent in Chinese and joined the diplomatic service, rising to become consul in the important trading port of Canton. Parks sent a message to the governor of Hong Kong, Sir John Bowring, seeking his assistance. And that assistance that Parks had in mind was from the Royal Navy. Sir John Bowring is an interesting character with an amazing career. Despite being keen to open China to British trade and willing to use gunboat diplomacy to achieve it, he was no die-in-the-wall imperialist from the landed classes. Born in 1792 in Exeter, Devon, he'd entered Parliament as a radical MP in his 20s. In Parliament, he had championed the cause of the Chartists, advocated the abolishment of flogging in the army, and was instrumental in the formation of the anti corn Law League. He introduced legislation that ended the effective feudalism in the Isle of Man, and was an early, very early, advocate of decimalisation. An absurdly talented linguist, he could, in one fashion or another, speak 100 languages. In the 1840s, he'd lost his money when his ironworks in South Wales failed. With his talent for languages, his parliamentary friend, Lord Palmerston, pulled a few strings and got Bowring a job as British consul in Canton. There, he worked closely with Harry Parks, who succeeded him when Bowring was appointed governor of Hong Kong in 1854. Receiving Parks' plea for assistance, Bowring ordered the commander of the China station, Admiral Sir Michael Seymour, to sail up the Pearl River and threaten to bombard Canton. With Seymour steaming towards him, Yu now offered to release the crew. Parks countered that he needed to issue an apology for seizing them. This Yu refused to do. And thus, at the end of October 1856, Admiral Seymour bombarded the forts protecting Canton. The Second Opium War, also called the Second China War, and also the Arrow War, had begun. I hope you're enjoying this story so far. Lots more coming in a moment, including the capture of Canton, that poison plot in Hong Kong, and a very disastrous battle led by a man whose surname was Hope. For the rest of the year, Seymour's fleet continued to patrol the Pearl River, blockading Canton, firing on forts, and firing on Chinese war junks sent against them. If this show of gunboat diplomacy was meant to cower you, it didn't. 
He defiantly offered a reward for every foreign barbarian head brought to him, and in December incited local mobs to attack and set fire to the European trading factories in the city. Whether it's the lure of the reward or nationalist fervour, we will never know, but there now occurred one of the most audacious poisoning plots in history. The plan was as simple as it was ambitious, to poison the entire British population in Hong Kong. On the 15th of January 1857, the Chinese baker, who supplied the entire colony's bread, laced his whole daily production with arsenic. And not just a little sprinkling of the poison. Later analysis at a laboratory in Berlin discovered that there was something like 38 to 42 grains of arsenic in every pound of bread. And that was actually his undoing. The dosage was so high that the victims were immediately sick, vomiting up the poison. And by that vomiting, the British in Hong Kong were saved. Bowering wrote to the British government, stating that military intervention was essential to ensure that the terms of the Treaty of Nanking and subsequent agreements were adhered to, and that the British be allowed to trade freely in China. It just so happened that the British Prime Minister was none other than Lord Palmerston, who had been Foreign Secretary back at the time of the First Opium War. The intervening decade since the Opium War had done nothing to dampen his hawkish stance to Britain's place in the world. If Bowering needed support, he would give it. Others in Parliament were not so sure. Just as at the time of the First War, one of the leading opponents was William Gladstone. He was joined by radicals such as Richard Cobden, who forced a vote censuring Bowering's actions, or as he called it, Bowering's War. Cobden's motion passed by 16 votes. A furious Palmerston called a general election, and whilst Liberal and Radical opponents in Parliament had been numerous, it seemed that they were out of step with the electorate, who returned Palmerston with an increased majority. The Prime Minister and Governor Bowring would have his war. Unlike the previous war, the British would now be joined by an ally, the French. As the self-appointed champion of spreading Catholic Christianity in the world, they were irritated by the way the Chinese, despite treaty agreements, were making life increasingly difficult for missionaries in the country. And things came to a head, quite literally, when a French missionary was tortured and decapitated by local Chinese officials. Rather like the Arrow Affair, the Chinese refused to issue an apology to the French barbarians. Meanwhile, a senior British diplomat was sent to oversee the expedition and drive further concessions from the Chinese. James Bruce, the 8th Earl of Elgin. The 47-year-old James Bruce was from the very top drawer of the British establishment. Educated at Eton and Oxford, his aristocratic father, the 7th Earl, had brought the Elgin marbles to Britain. Bruce had already served as Governor of Jamaica and Governor General of Canada. Cultivated, highly intelligent, with connections. If there was one downside, it was that he tended to adopt a conciliatory stance, or at least a lot more conciliatory than Palmerston. But before Elgin reached China, and whilst the troop ships were still on the high seas, events in India were to intervene. In May of 1857, the Indian Mutiny, or Great Rebellion, erupted. I've told several stories about this revolt against British rule, so I won't go into any details now. Maybe check them out afterwards. Suffice to say, it was the greatest military challenge to Britain's imperial rule since the American Revolution. All troops that could possibly be provided were shipped to India. War with China would just have to wait. Eventually, in mid-October 1857, Elgin arrived in Hong Kong. Whilst the earmarked troops were still fighting their way around India, Elgin decided to approach the Chinese. He offered Governor Ye in Canton a diplomatic solution out of the looming conflict. If the Chinese agree to pay compensation for the damage in the city and allow foreign merchants free movement outside of their factories, he would order Admiral Seymour to sail out of the Pearl River. It was a small price to pay to avoid a bloody war. Unfortunately for Elgin, he was dealing with arrogant, xenophobic Ye. The Chinese official rejected his overture out of hand. On the 28th of December 1857, Seymour bombarded Canton and a joint British-French assault party landed and stormed the walls and the heights above the city. 
A week later, they descended into the city itself and captured Ye as the stout official was attempting to climb over a wall to escape his compound. In line with his usual conciliatory approach, Elgin now installed a more compliant local official and handed the city back to the Chinese. He also offered to meet Chinese government officials to discuss a new treaty, which would open up Peking to foreign missions. The Chinese government still saw the world with China in the centre. They were baffled as to why these white barbarians thought they could deal with the Chinese as equals. They rejected Elgin's request. Admiral Seymour was now ordered to head to the mouth of the Hai River in a show of force to bring the Chinese to the negotiating table. The mouth of this vital river route to Peking, now called Beijing, was protected by four mighty forts, the Taku Forts. On the 20th of May, 1858, the British and French landed. The British forces were commanded by Colonel Gerald Graham, VC. Graham, a Royal Engineer, was awarded the Victoria Cross during the Crimean War. He would go on to lead the British in the wars in Sudan in the 1880s at the battles of Tamai and El Teb. Reporting into Graham was another Royal Engineer, Garnet Wolseley. It's amazing to find that in this second opium war, we have three characters who feature heavily in the Sudan campaign in the 1880s. Graham, who I've just mentioned, Wolseley, who would lead the Nile expedition to rescue Charles Gordon in Khartoum, and finally, there was Charles Gordon himself. And I'll tell you all about him in the second episode, so make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss it. Anyway, back to the Taku Forts, 1858. With the covering fire from Seymour ships, Graham's British soldiers and their French allies stormed the forts. In comparison to later battles at these Taku Forts, it was a reasonably easy encounter. The British lost 13 killed and 83 wounded. Total French casualties were just 32. At the end of June 1858, the Chinese signed the Treaty of Tianjin with the British. By its terms, they agreed to open up 10 more ports to British vessels. They confirmed that British subjects would be tried in British courts for crimes committed in China. British merchants were free to travel throughout the country and, with a nod to the French, there was freedom of movement for missionaries. Diplomatic missions would also be established in Peking. The Chinese would pay an indemnity of $4 million for the damage to British property in Canton and for the cost of this military expedition. And finally, the opium trade would be legalised. Elgin was one of those in Britain who had many reservations about this last point. It was one of those moral dilemmas that politicians and leaders have to grapple with. Whilst the Chinese had banned the import of the narcotic, something like 60,000 chests of opium were being smuggled into the country every year. If the Chinese seriously tried to stamp it out, it would have a damaging effect on British India, where most of the crops were grown. On the other hand, because it was being smuggled into the country, the Chinese authorities were losing out on any income from tariffs. So it was one of those hold-your-nose agreements. The British protected their economy in India, the Chinese government finally earned some revenue out of their citizens' drug habit. It's often forgotten, in light of the dominant role of the British Empire in the 19th century, that it wasn't just the British forcing these unequal treaties on the Chinese. At Tianjin, the Chinese also signed treaties with the French, the Russians and the Americans. With the treaty signed, Elgin and Admiral Seymour now set off on a new adventure, taking a yacht, which was a gift from Queen Victoria, to Japan. The objective was not to get the Japanese into sailing at cows, but to open up their ports to British trade. But that story is for another day. Seymour would return to Britain and enter Parliament as MP for Devonport. He died in 1887, and Seymour Road in Hong Kong is named after him. Elgin would also return to Britain and enter Palmerston's cabinet. But he was to return to China. And that return, and the reasons why, are the next part of this story. So here we go. It didn't take long for things to go pear-shaped in China. With the British and French forces safely out of the country, the Chinese repudiated the Treaty of Tinsing. They said it had been signed under duress, and anyway, they were the celestial empire who didn't deal with barbarians as equals. When the British and French ambassadors tried to land and head to Peking, they were refused entry. And as they retreated with their tails between their legs, the two ambassadors couldn't fail to notice that the Taku forts were being reinforced. 
It was obvious that should the British and French try their gunboat diplomacy again, the Chinese would this time be ready for them. With the Chinese repudiating the recently signed treaty, the French and British once more assembled a force to teach the Chinese a lesson. But on this occasion, it would be the British who would be humiliated. It would have some echoes of Dunkirk in 1940, with soldiers up to their necks in water, patiently awaiting evacuation. It would also see a young John Jackie Fisher have his first taste of action, and American naval commander Josiah Tatnall coming to the aid of the British with his classic words, blood is thicker than water. So, are you ready? The new commander of the Royal Navy in China, Admiral Sir James Hope, decided to once more take out the Taku forts. The aim, as much as there was one, was having seized the forts to march inland and threaten the imperial capital at Beijing. Whether they actually intended to storm the capital was never clear. Actually, it wasn't the only part of the plan that wasn't clear, as you're about to find out. Admiral Sir James Hope was born in 1808. He came from a naval family. Indeed, just three years before his birth, his father had fought at the Battle of Trafalgar. Entering the Royal Navy in 1820, Sir James had seen limited action in Uruguay and then again in the Baltic during the Crimean War. The scene that confronted Hope when he arrived at the mouth of the High River in June 1859 was very different to what Seymour had met the previous year. During those 12 months, the Chinese had been hard at work, refortifying their defences, bringing in reinforcements and dragging more cannon into the forts. They'd also blocked the river with a series of booms. These consisted of rafts chained together. The barrier was made even more tricky by the Chinese placing wooden and metal spikes and iron piles alongside the booms. Despite both these obstacles and the reinforced forts on the shoreline, Hope decided to force a passage up the river. On the 24th of June 1859, his sailors cut the chains holding the first boom into position, and at around 2.30pm, the gunboat, HMS Oppersum, nosed her way through the gap. She was followed by Hope on board his flagship, HMS Plover. Launched in 1855, the Plover was an albacore gunboat, specifically designed to operate in coastal waters and inland rivers, rather than the high seas. The previous day, her commander, 26-year-old Lieutenant William Rasson, a native of Sussex, had gone to the aid of an American steamer, the Toy One, which had become stuck on the riverbed. Despite its name, this Chinese vessel was actually crewed by a contingent from the US Navy under the command of Josiah Tatnall. The Americans were not involved in the war, but nevertheless they shared similar goals to the British and French regarding the opening up of China. They were both sympathetic to the cause and equally keen not to miss out on any treaty advantages that the British and French might wrest from the Chinese this time round. Tatnall is going to feature in this story again in a little while. As his fleet steamed forward, Admiral Hope seated himself on a coil of rope at the front of the plover. His admiral's blue square flag flew proudly in the breeze. Suddenly, matting on the sides of the forts dropped down, revealing cannon that Hope had not spotted in his reconnaissance. And almost immediately, with a roar, they opened up. Unlike Seymour's encounter the previous year, this time the Chinese gunners were both committed and accurate. HMS Plover, flying the admiral's flag, was an obvious target. The first shot hit Lieutenant Rasson's head, killing him instantly. There's a memorial to him in St Mary's Church in Eastbourne, where his family used to worship. Of the 40-man crew, only nine were to escape this bombardment without injury. Admiral Hope himself was seriously injured in the right leg. Quickly, the British gunboats sank in the river. The Chinese gunners now turned their attention to HMS Cormorant, which they swiftly disabled. Next, they sank another gunboat, the Kestrel, whilst in the confusion, HMS Lee ran aground. Through the din and smoke of the Chinese guns and the returning fire from the Royal Navy, British sailors, including Admiral Hope, floundered in the water. US Captain Josiah Tatnall felt that he couldn't just sit there watching on. Born in Georgia in 1795, Tatnall had served as a midshipman fighting the British in the War of 1812. But now, with a cry of, blood is thicker than water, he ordered his vessel into the battle to rescue the stricken British sailors. It would go down in history as the first time that the British and American forces operated alongside each other, even if it was merely a rescue mission. Despite his injury, the rescued Hope now reorganised his fleet, which proceeded to bombard the forts. And by 6.30pm, 
the Chinese guns had been silenced. It was time for Hope to unleash his sailors and marines to storm the forts. After all, with a large proportion of their cannon disabled, the defenders were like sitting ducks. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, you're about to find out. At 7pm, with darkness settling over the river, 20 boats rowed towards the shoreline. They carried a small contingent of sappers or engineers to attack the mighty Chinese walls, a brigade of marines, and detachments of sailors, mainly from the Royal Navy, although a small French contingent was also in the mix. As the first boats landed and their occupants leapt overboard, they were hit by a withering fire of shot, musket balls, arrows and rockets from the defenders. As if this ferocious fire wasn't bad enough, the British and their French allies found themselves struggling through thick, knee-deep mud. In some places, this oozing slime came up to their waists. Just 100 men managed to make it through the mud to the first of three defensive ditches that barred their ways to the walls of the forts. Most of their rifles were wet and useless. As the long night continued, about 50 of the British sailors managed to make their way to the last ditch. Above them on the walls, the Chinese lowered fireworks down on ropes to light up their positions, allowing archers to fire at them. With no support, they gave up any idea of trying to assault the fortress, and retreated across the mud with arrows and musket balls whizzing all around them. The British attack had turned into a chaotic disaster, and it was going to get worse. The force made their way back down to the shoreline, where they waded neck deep into the water waiting for rescue. It had echoes of Dunkirk, 80 years later. All the while they were illuminated by blue lights, fired into the air from the forts, allowing the defenders to continue to pick off the attackers, and worse still, some of the rescue boats. As they tried to escape carrying survivors, several capsized. It took until 1.30 in the morning for the whole British and French force to be evacuated. One of those evacuated was a young midshipman, 18-year-old John Fisher. John, or Jackie as he was known, would go on to become an admiral of the fleet and was instrumental in preparing the Royal Navy for the First World War, including the development of the dreadnoughts. Of the 1,000 men who had landed six hours ago, 89 British and four French had been killed and 262 wounded, nearly a third of Hope's force. The defeat, as historian Ian Hernan wrote, was both complete and utterly humiliating. It was the first time that the Chinese had defeated a Western power in a significant battle. They were elated. Back home, the British were shocked. Some blamed Hope for poor planning. Others blamed the Chinese for treacherously opening fire on the fleet without warning. And whilst Lord Elgin, who was now in Lord Palmerston's cabinet as Postmaster General, urged a conciliatory approach to the Chinese, British newspapers loudly shouted for revenge. And it was the press that the British Prime Minister listened to. The biggest Western army the Chinese had yet seen, 11,000 British and 7,000 French troops, along with an armada of 200 frigates, gunboats and transport ships, now headed for China. The Second Opium War still has a long way to run. So watch out for my next episode, where I'll tell you about how the Taco Forts are finally stormed by the British in an action where seven Victoria Crosses would be awarded, including one to a 15-year-old. That successful military action would see Peking, or Beijing, occupied by the victorious Western allies. You'll also hear how future general Garnet Wolsey narrowly missed out on being beheaded by the Chinese, and how Charles' Chinese Gordon helped burn the Emperor's palace to the ground. Until then, please check out some of my other videos, or support me by joining my members' channel, and thanks to G, Alistair and Daryl for already doing so. I'm Chris Green, the History Chap. Thanks for joining me today. Keep well, and I'll see you with my next instalment very soon.